So today we are going to learn freedom of navigation. So last class, uh, can someone recapitulate what we learned? Of course, for the first chapter, we learned, uh, you know, a little bit of history on how the law of the sea, it, it really developed. Then after that, we learned about different demarcations uh, with respect to the waters in the world. We learned about um, how there are rivers as internal waters of any particular state party or the states in international law we call countries as states and uh, we learned about uh, the, the the definition of the high sea the territorial waters what are the demarcations how many nautical miles they are and the eez and so on today we will learn about freedom of navigation and i'm also going to delve into the aspect of the high seas so today's class will finish two short chapters that is freedom of navigation or FON and we're also going to talk about the high seas. First, we'll finish up with the freedom of navigation as you can see on the screen here. Now, what is this freedom of navigation? We call it as an indispensable part of the law of the sea. That means something that which cannot be taken away from uh, the law of the sea. That is something which is, uh, you know, thoroughly or uh, it's, kind of intricately uh, a part of, of the law of the sea. It is like interwoven in the law of the sea. It is part of a very important part of, <coughs> sorry, the law of the sea. Now we call it as a foundation stone or, uh, you know, the bedrock of the law of the sea, or you call it as a foundation stone of the law of the sea, the freedom of navigation. So one of the purposes of the law of the sea is to ensure peaceful navigation. And Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines freedom of navigation as a right recognized in international law, especially by treaties or agreements for vessels that are ships of one or all states to navigate streams passing through two or more states. Uh, the more states that means they've got the right to use the waters and to navigate through the waters and to uh, sail over the waters. That is basically the freedom of navigation. Next is in the Oscar Shins case, Britain versus Belgium. It's way back in 1934. The Permanent Court of International Justice. Now, just for your information, the PCJ, as we used to call it once upon a time, way back you know, in 1934. Today, we call it as the International Court of Justice or ICJ. So way back, it was called uh, in 1934 as a Permanent Court of International Justice or PCJ. On December 12, 1934, they in a particular case of Oscar Shin, they call it as Oscar Shin's case. And uh, the entire citas citation is there on your screen that is Britain versus Belgium, 1934, PCIJ, and so on. So it defined the freedom of navigation as freedom of movement for vessels, freedom to enter ports and to make use of plant and docks to load and unload goods and to transport goods and passengers. That means they said that a vessel or a ship has got the right to enter any seaport and to make use of the plant that is the area and the docks and that is where the ships are. Uh, they normally... Uh, you know, they are parked there or the ships where they are, the, the docks that are there and the goods, uh, they are permitted to load goods or unload goods and also to transport passengers as well along with the goods. That's freedom of movement for the ships. In Dupe versus Wigness in the 1991 treatise that is in their write-up at page 836, they opine that freedom of navigation is a principle of law of the sea that ships flying the flag of any sovereign state shall not suffer interference from other states apart from the exceptions provided for in international law. That means they're saying it is that principle of the law of the sea that allows the ships or the sea vessels to move freely upon the waters, but they have to be flying the flag of that particular sovereign state to which they belong to. And they should not suffer interference or they should not be stopped or prohibited by the other states apart from the exceptions that are provided for in international. That is, unless and otherwise the law prohibits the movement of the sea vessels, they should not be prohibited. Next now, FON, of course, is codified under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea at 87 and 90 uh, articles 
uh, and it says, especially in 87, it specifically states that under the clause freedom of the high seas, that the high seas are open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. Freedom of the high seas is exercised under the conditions laid down by this particular convention, that is the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, and by other rules of international law. That means the high seas. Remember, we, uh, last class we studied about the demarcation of the high sea and after how many certain nautical miles in the high sea begins. So after the territorial seas, after the EEZ, so the high seas are open to all countries, to all states. So in international law, I'm reiterating that, uh, you know, we call uh, countries as states. So the high seas are open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. The freedom of high seas is exercised under the conditions laid down by which convention? The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and by other rules of international law. Now, this comprises inter alia both the coastal and the landlocked states and it gives them the freedom of navigation, that is to freely move about the seas, freedom of overflight, freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines. Again, that's subject to part six of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea uh, that uh, basically deals with the continental shelf. And then it's got the freedom to, they got the freedom to construct artificial islands and other installations permitted under the international uh, law, freedom of fishing, subject to conditions, again, which are laid down in section two and freedom of scientific research. So basically it is this particular article that gives them the freedom of navigation, freedom of navigation. Apart from that, they give them also the freedom of the state parties can enjoy the freedom of overflight, to, then the freedom to lay submarine cables, freedom to construct artificial islands, freedom of fishing, and also freedom of uh, scientific research. So these freedoms shall be exercised by all countries, by all states. They can freely navigate with due regard for the interests of other states. That means they must consider the interests, the rules that uh, are uh, that are governing the other state parties around particular waters. So they should consider the interests of other countries as well, while you're enjoying their freedom of navigation and using the high seas, and also must respect or uh, you know be under the ambit of uh, or boundaries of this convention of the law of the sea. This is Article 90, which speaks specifically uh, about the right of navigation, right of navigation. <clears throat> So every state, whether coastal or landlocked, has the right to sail ships flying its flag on the high seas. So international law of the sea evolved over the years. And this we have been repeating over the last two classes. And that it has been evolving. And it goes without saying that it has been evolving over the years. And the law that we have today is what we have because of how the world developed over the years and how the law of the sea got concretized over the years. So the law of the sea, of course, it evolved over the years, it concretized uh, over the years. And now specifically, it, uh, you know, it is, um, uh, you know, it is concretized even the right of freedom of navigational FON. Further, the right evolved with its operational ramifications that led to the concept of freedom of navigation operations, that is FONOPS. F-O-N-O-P-S, it's abbreviated. So freedom of navigation operations, which operational freedom is based on sovereignty and interdependence of the state to enforce such a right. So thereby, we learned about the freedom of navigation that the state parties um, uh, are under the international law of the sea. They've got the right to use the high seas and to move about the high seas, but with due respects and following the norms of the other state parties and following the laws and also being in consonance with the international law of the sea, they've got the right to navigate the freedom of navigation as well as the right of navigation. That is Article 89 and Article 90 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Do you have any questions? But however, if this question comes for your exam, you will have to write the two uh, the, the case law, especially the, the, the just two citations that I've given here, one is a case law. There's the Oscar Shins case, uh, which is decided by the Permanent Court of International Justice. And also you're supposed to refer to the treatise of Dupi versus Wigness of 1991, where they have given a fabulous 
uh, you know, opinion there where they say that uh, freedom of navigation is a principle of the law of the sea that ships flying the flag of any sovereign state shall not suffer interference. That means they should not be prohibited by the other states apart from the exceptions provided for in international law. That is, they got the freedom to sail in the high seas. They got the freedom of navigation. They got the right of navigation. That is a freedom to move their ships, to move their vessels, freedom to enter the ports, the seaports, and to use plants, docks, load goods, unload goods, and transport goods. So if anyone asks you who has given the ships rights to uh, move about in the high seas, it is the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, where every country has got the right to use the high seas, the waters of the high seas, the free, they've got the freedom to navigate through the waters, move through the waters, sail through the waters. The vessels can move, can you know transport goods, can transport passengers. Now, of course, they can do everything, but everything they can do, but within the ambit of the law. They have to, uh, you know, abide by the international law as well as the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. They have to abide by those rules. Okay, that means that's how your goods are transported from one country to another. That's how we have got passenger ships flying from one country to another and so on. So do you have any questions? If not, we'll move without wasting any time to the next chapter. And in case we get disconnected, please join back.